Amen. Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, a privilege for me to stand before you this morning and bring the word. Uh, February, as you know it, those of you who have been in Cornerstone, is our vision month. That is where the pastor normally lays for us, the senior pastor lays for us what the vision is for the year. Not that we don't have our vision and our goals, but on an annual basis, he gives a direction in which we need to go so that we get to that uh, goal or that purpose. Last week already, pastor taught on a topic called leave your purpose. Uh, you would find that in the month of February, we are going to be focusing on a theme that uh, he has given, which is in pursuit of God's purpose. So that would be our theme for the month of February. And each of the preachers will come with a subtopic. Now, this morning, I want to start with uh, a known verse, which was also quoted last week as Pastor preached from Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. I also like it in the uh, NLT translation. It says, when people do not accept divine guidance or divine revelation, they run wild. <laughs> now, we don't want people to run wild without restraint. And so certainly in this house, there is vision. And where there is vision and there is divine revelation, then there's always clarity of purpose and clarity of goals. And that is what I want to be speaking to you about today. Pressing on towards the goal. Pressing on towards the goal. And every one of us here might feel we have different goals, but as we go along, you would see how your goal and your purposes are actually linked to the purposes and goals of this house as well as the universal church uh, in general. Now, I've taken the liberty of just checking out some of the synonyms for goal. Now, one of the other words that can be used uh, in place of goal is purpose. And in the word today, I am going to be using purpose and goal interchangeably. But there are many other words, for example, motive, motivation, the grounds for something, the impetus, the reason, the plan, the objective, the benefit, the usefulness. So in other words, purpose or goal is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. So in other words, for you to also exist, there's a goal. Do you know the goal for which you exist? Do you know the purpose for which God created you? Because every manufacturer creates something with a purpose. Do you already know it? And so, if you know it, are you pursuing it? If you don't know it, then you have to find out very quickly after today's sermon. And if you are still pursuing it, praise be to God. And if you're if you going on a detour a little bit, we hope that the word will bring you back in line. May the Lord bless his word today. We're going to read our Bible text from which this message is going to be based on from Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. And I'm going to read. This is Paul now speaking, writing to the church in Philippi, or to the Philippians as we usually say. And Paul writes and says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I think that passage is self-explanatory, but we're going to pull out at least three key points from what Paul is saying and writing to the Philippians and see how that could be applied in our lives today. I think very clearly for me, the first thing is Paul identifies his goal. 
the goal is clearly identified and clearly defined. He talks about, depending on which version you're reading, the King James Version, he talks about pressing towards the mark of the high calling. He talks about knowing Christ, knowing Jesus in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. For Paul, that was the ultimate prize. He felt he needed to experience Jesus in all those ways. And so if that was Paul's ultimate prize, well, that was his spiritual goal. This morning, I'm asking each and every one of us, including myself, and I believe that we have asked this question before in this church, and we ask it time and time again. Yes, because even the Bible, you must read it time and time again from the beginning to end every year. That, that is one book that never goes obsolete. So you, the word of the Lord remains fresh. And why does God want us to be conscientized about this annually so that we don't miss the mark? And my question again, as we repeat it again this year is, do you know what your goal is? And are you still focused on that goal? Are you still in the path to achieving it? Can you identify what the goal is and where you are? You know, Paul's goal was not just for him to know Christ. He also wanted all the churches that he was associated with to also come to that revelation. If you read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, and I'm going to read quickly. Paul uh, writes to the Ephesians and says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, what is that power? What is that incomparably great power? That power that we cannot compare to anything. He says that power is that same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that uh, the Lord God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him on the right hand in heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. So Paul wants us to know that power. Paul doesn't want to see resurrection as something that was um, a historical event that happened in the past, then we tell the story, then it's gone. Mm -mm. For us as children of God, that resurrection power is supposed to be alive on a daily basis because that resurrection power helps us to lead a victorious Christian life. And so he says he wants to know that power. But he doesn't want to know only the power of the resurrection because for Paul, suffering with Christ is a privilege. And therefore, even in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he tells us that he had a thorn in the flesh. Three times he pleaded with the Lord to take it away. But the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, he says, I boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. In other words, Paul is saying he delights in the weaknesses. He delights in the persecutions. because He delights in situations where he knows that he cannot do it himself. If you can do things yourself, you will not trust God for them. You can only trust God for the things that you cannot do. You might actually underestimate God's power if you have the abilities to solve all your problems. You might begin to think, it is myself. Myself and my strength has given me all of this. But when you find yourself in a situation of a challenge where even surviving the challenge, you know that if it is not for God, as the word says, had it not been for God who was on our side, we would have been swept away. When you find yourself in that challenge where when you come on the other side of the challenge and you look back, it's like, what was this? And how did I go through it? Today, I might be speaking to somebody. And I'm saying to you, rest in the Lord. Depend on the Lord. The word of the Lord says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto his own, your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. When you begin to believe that in your own power you can do things, then you can. And therefore, God, Paul says, even in my weakness, I like it more. Because that is when the power of God really comes to show. 
The second point is Paul recognizes his current status in terms of achieving the goal. He knows he has not yet reached there. And that is why he says, I am not there yet. I've not attained this goal. But I am pressing on. I know that I've not yet attained it. In as much as when he wrote this, he was at a high level of spiritual maturity already. So I quote from Warren Wisby this morning. It says, a divine dissatisfaction is essential for spiritual progress. A divine dissatisfaction is, is, is um, essential for spiritual progress. Once you become satisfied, you will never move. You will never progress. In anything that you are satisfied with, you are going to remain there. But where you have divine dissatisfaction about certain situations in your life, that is actually the Holy Spirit prompting you to move. Because you must be able to get to a place where you say, no, this is not possible. I have been sick for the past how many years and the word of the Lord says that by his stripes I was healed. So I am refusing the sickness. I am not going to accept it. I have to get better. You can say to yourself, you know what, I am not growing in the things of the Lord. People are speaking in tongues, I'm not yet speaking in tongues. People are getting divine revelations and visions, I've not yet experienced that. For how many years I've been a Christian, that is divine dissatisfaction, to be in the presence of the Lord and to hear from Him. And so I'm saying, God, 2022, I am not going to remain there. I have to move on. I have to hear. When people say, I heard from the Lord, I must be also, also be able to stand and say, I heard from the Lord. Divine dissatisfaction is essential for spiritual progress. For me, I say for any progress at all. Paul understood that he had not yet laid hold of that which God laid hold of him. You know, he says, I want to lay hold, meaning I want to take that which Christ took me. Do you know the reason why God laid hold of you? And while in, in terms of Paul's case, it was very dramatic. We know how he, he got blind on the way to Damascus, blah, blah. I'm not going to go into the story. But then when the Lord spoke to Ananias to say to him, go to that man. He said, go to him. He's a chosen instrument to proclaim my word or my name to the Gentiles. So Paul, apart from God saving him, it wasn't enough that God saved him just to go to heaven, you know, hallelujah, his, his place in eternity is secured. But there was a particular goal. And while he was doing this, yes, he had already started when he wrote this letter to the Philippians. But he says, I have not yet completely taken hold of that which Christ took hold of me. My question this morning is, have you taken hold of that which Christ took hold of you for? I'm talking to those who are already children of God, those who are already Christians. Are you living your purpose as pastor preached to us last week? And even if you say, I am one step in and, you know, there's still a lot of areas that I need to cover, are you pressing on? And that is our word for today. Are you pressing on? Paul says, forgetting the past, forgetting what is behind me, I press on towards the mark. I press on towards the mark of that high calling. I press on. I forget what is behind. Why is Paul wanting to forget what is behind and the past? Because the past has a way of limiting us. Whether it's a good past or a bad past, the past has a way of limiting us. If you look at the past and it's bad, the regrets and the failures will always put a hindrance of fear in your spirit and build a stronghold there. And every time you have a challenge, you think, I have failed 10 times. I can as well fail again this time. You are afraid to take a step in faith. And if you have been successful in the past, and the past is a lot of good things, what do you do? You look at that situation and you become complacent because you think, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. What next do I need? So the past is very limiting. And I say to all of us, according to the word in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, the path of the righteous is like a morning sun. It shines ever brighter and brighter till the full light of day. Our paths are supposed to get better. Your yesterday cannot be better than your tomorrow. If your experience today sitting here is that your yesterday 
was better than your today. Your 2021 looks as if it's better than what you are seeing in 2022. Then we will pray. Because that is not the will of God. Then we will press on. Pressing on is not easy. You know, I took the liberty of looking at the meaning of the word press. It says pressing on means to continue moving forward in a forceful and steady way. Forceful. So some force is required. You have to continue in a determined way. Pressing on requires us to persevere and to persist. So certainly it means when you persisting and persevering, that simply means there could be some resistance. So when you are going against resistance, you have to use force. And that is why the Bible says we must fight the good fight. A Christian who doesn't want to fight is a Christian who doesn't want to be a Christian. In fact, it's a Christian who wants to throw in the towel. Remember why the word of the Lord is saying to us we should fight a good fight. What is a good fight? A good fight is a fight that you are winning. You can ask the boxers and the wrestlers. When they come out of the ring and say, how was your, I had a good fight. They would have been beaten, there could be some bruises or what, but they won the fight. At the end of the day, they won the fight. And so they call it a good fight. Yes, there could have been some pain and injury and whatever to show for it, scars to show for it. But they are carrying the trophy. Today you may be carrying scars on your body concerning a lot of things that could have happened in your life. But I prophesy to you and say you must carry your trophy. At the end of the day, what is important is that you are holding that trophy. You are still pressing on. You are not giving in. And somebody might say, you know, but I have been fighting. I've been fighting battles all my life. I've been praying for this thing for a long time and it's not coming. Well, I'm saying keep praying. Or you are saying, I've been declaring the word. The word says we should declare and believe. I've been declaring and believing. I'm not seeing it come to pass. Keep declaring. Because every word is putting, uh, 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 is breaking down a part of that wall. And maybe you need just one more declaration. And you might be saying, I've been obeying the word of God for so, so long, you know, giving my tithes and offerings and sowing seed according to the word. I've not seen a reward yet. Well, keep obeying. Press on. Do not allow the devil to have a walkover concerning your life. Do you know what a walkover is? I remember when we used to be at school. I know it still happens now. You have those tournaments and you go for some sports to other schools and they will say maybe there are three teams that are supposed to play uh, under 12, under 18, under whatever. And you find that maybe one of the uh, schools does not have a team in that category. Do you know that in those days, the team that is available will still pitch? You will still go and stand there even though that other team, the op op opponents are not there you will still, this team will still go and pitch. And then we used to do some naughty things, you know, because there's nobody there, you just run to their side, run anyhow you like, throw in a lot of uh, uh, balls and score as many, whatever. Of course, the referee could have just said walk over, but it is symbolic that you still pitch. Now, and you come out and you say, we had a walk over. There was no contest. You didn't need to fight. Do you want the devil to say no contest concerning your life? Do you want him to say it's a walkover so that you just allow him to come and do whatever you want and you don't keep pressing on? I am saying to you this morning, if you have thrown away your sword, pick it up and get back onto the ring. It's only those who are fighting that can win. If you stop fighting, you cannot win. If you are not there in the contest at all, then it's a walkover. We will never give him a walkover. We keep pressing on because the word of the Lord says he who has started a good work in us will bring it to completion. And you might be asking yourself, so what is God's purpose for my life? And I thought I needed to add, it, add this to this sermon. And while your individual manifestations may be different, but the purpose is one and the same. It might manifest differently in my life and what because we are all part of the body of Christ. And we will do little things here and there to bring out that uh, full purpose. But then we are all in that. One, very quickly, is that all men may be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the first purpose of God. His divine will for us is that because we came from him, 
We sang this morning that he's the one that gives us breath, isn't it? So we came from him. He wants us to return to him and not to be lost. So his number one purpose is that all of us will be saved and have that eternal life. He desires um, intimacy with us. If you read in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15, I want to read very quickly. When Jesus was collecting uh, and calling his disciples, this is what he said, the Bible says. Jesus went up to a mountainside and he called to those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. But what is the first thing? That they might be with him. Thereafter, he might send them out to preach and to have all authority to drive out demons. So here again, it's about us being with God. That's his first priority. In that priority, he wants us to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. He wants us to be a replica, image of the likeness of Christ. It's only by our intimacy with Christ that we can become like him. You know, some people used to say that when couples are married husband and wife, that after a while they start looking uh, alike. I don't know how that happens because they have different genes. I can understand the children looking the same. But they say that somehow you begin to see, but I believe it's because they come up now, they've spent so much time together, they begin to have the same likes, the same mannerisms, the same joy, the same way they do things in this household. So God wants us to be conformed to the image of Christ. And we can only be conformed if we are always with Christ. Looking at him, gazing at him, having a mirror image of him. Then we know that we should. The word in Romans chapter 8 verse 29, I read very quickly from God's word translation. It says, this is true because he already knew his people and had already appointed them to have the same form as the image of his son. Therefore, his son is the firstborn among many children. So we are all his children, and Jesus is just the firstborn. We are number two, three, four thousands, and whatever, all following that to be conformed to the image of Christ. And the third point is the Lord wants us to be effective witnesses. A witness is not. You just carrying the Bible, taking some tracts, going to the street, and doing some little evangelism. Uh, oh, I went for witnessing. Mm -mm. That's a very narrow idea of what being a Christian witness is. A witness is about your entire life. That everything in your life says something about God. Remember, a witness is somebody who has seen something taking place. And is able to tell what they either saw or what they heard or what they have experienced. Is your life able to say, I have seen God. I have heard God. I have experienced God. What is your testimony? When somebody looks at you, whether in your workplace, in your career, in your business, or whatever has transpired in your life, are they able to look? When they look at you, what do they say? Do they look at you and say, I can see the mercy of God. I can see the grace of God. I can see the faithfulness of God. I can see the abundance of God. I can see the goodness of God. I want to testify. I want to believe that when you look at me, you can see that God is a restorer. I believe that you can see that God is a deliverer. I believe you can see that he is a healer and he is a sustainer and he is faithful and he's a good, good father. He's the lifter of my head. What can you testify to God this morning? You can open your mouth and say, I know that I know that I know that he is faithful. He will never leave me nor forsake me. All the promises that he has made for me, he has always brought them to pass. Let's give God glory this morning in the house. Hallelujah. May our lives continue, be, continue to be good and effective witnesses to the glory of God. 
whatever your secular life is, it's still a witness. In that secular life, what you do there can be a witness. Now, most of the times, it's not easy. As we said, you have to press on. You have to press. Can you imagine when you put a cloth on the table, you put an iron, you press it hard. If, if it's a cloth that has a lot of wrinkles, the harder you press. But there are some of them that don't even need any pressing. You just use the steam and do this and the wrinkles are out. So it depends on what you are going through. There are some of them that you have to press like crazy. But you must continue pressing. There are other things that will come today and one prayer item and off it goes and you are fine. But I don't care what it is. Whether it's the hard one or it's the easy one, all we are saying is we're going to keep pressing. We are not going to allow the devil to have a walkover. In the name of Jesus. There are a number of famous people that I want to share some bits of their lives with you today. Who also had to endure a lot of difficulty before they came through. If you're looking at the screen, the one on the first, that's Walt Disney. Now, his first cartoon business went bankrupt. With the loss of that business, Google says, Disney packed his bags and with just about $40 to his name, he took off to Los Angeles. He tried his hands on acting and so many other things. In fact, it says he was turned down 302 times. His proposal was turned down 302 times. I know those of us who deal with proposals and whatever. When it's turned down two or three times, you are like, what? 302 times before it was finally accepted. Talk about perseverance. May God give us the spirit to persevere. And he is, he is a household name everywhere in the world today because he persevered. And if you can imagine being born in rural Mississippi in the 1950s to an impoverished teenage mother, single mother, imagine suffering abuse at the age of nine, running away from home at the age of 13, of course, when a 13-year-old girl, girl runs away from home, the obvious, becoming pregnant at 14 and even losing that first child. That is the background of Oprah Winfrey, whom we all celebrate today. But she could have stayed on the streets. She could have remained. There are others who remained on the streets. But she pressed on and said, that is not my life. I am made for better. Can I hear from people who are made for better today? Who know that they are made for better? In the name of Jesus. And if you are Thomas, if you, if you are uh, Cornel Sanders, you would have been rejected. Your recipe would have been rejected 1,009 times. I'm not talking 100. 1,009 times. Cornel Sanders started this when he was young. His recipe for KFC was only accepted when he was in his 70s. Today, his legacy lives on. And whenever we want a fast one, even in South Africa, we drive through. If he had given up, that recipe would never have seen the light of day. And what about Thomas Edison, who is the one who invented the light bulb? His teachers said he was too stupid to learn anything. There are some of us that people have spoken negative words into our lives. Are you going to allow those negative words to keep speaking? No. The universe has ears. Counter those words by speaking what the word of the Lord says concerning your life. Declare it and say, I am the head and I'm not the tail. I am above only, never beneath. Now, when your children come back and they say somebody said something uh, uh, nasty to them, tell them, you are the fruit of my womb. And the word of the Lord says, the fruit of my womb is blessed. So you are blessed, irrespective of what anybody is saying. Learn to counter that word. Well, true to what the teachers declared, Thomas Edison was fired from his first two, two jobs as being unproductive. Tell me about that. That could have built a stronghold. 
but he decided no I'll continue and after 1,000 unsuccessful attempts 1,000 on attempt number 1001 he was able to invent the light bulb today we have different variations of those bulbs but the initial thing came from him and we are now testifying to that because he didn't give up can we talk about Abraham Lincoln if you search you'll find how many failures he had before he became president of America and what of our own very child of God Joyce Meyer who has impacted the world in so many ways a young life of abuse and rejection but she came out of that life and today over 40 years in ministry she has impacted so what is your story and what is the past what is your excuse because there is none so far as you have heard the word of the Lord you must press on and go on there are some times that we look at some people even in business those who we look at we see in business they are so successful I'm like oh ah you know look at the success look at the car look at the whatever do you know how many proposals they wrote <laughs> do you know how many of those proposals were rejected do you even know whether they had they have had two or three other businesses that they decided to close down because they were not lucrative if they stopped at that point will you be ooing and I no so I am saying to all of us if there is somebody actually whose life you think your purpose follows the, the, the path of that life understudy them be a disciple go and check how it was and I want to say for those who have reached that level and when people come to you do not say it was by my own strength I did this and I did that first and foremost the glory goes to God for he is the one that gives us the power to create wealth in the name of Jesus he gives us the energy the ability the wisdom and the everything to be able to devise these plans the glory goes back to him and then you begin to say do not give up you might have challenges I did have challenges but I did not give up and so today we are saying pressing on involves pushing through. Sometimes it may involve pushing through a painful situation. Other times, you just want to sprint towards holiness. You know, there's this sin or something that is dragging you back. You say, no, I want to get closer to God. And yet, at other times, you might want a clearer vision of what your calling is. Or what the career, you know, you, you might want to, to, to find yourself being elevated in your career or you might be pushing your family to a particular destiny in terms of you know what your family goals are but for all of this for all of this whatever happens God expects that the outcome must testify to his glory because that outcome which is positive is what makes you an effective witness to the Lord and that is one of his aims that every one of us as we become increasingly increasingly conformed to the likeness of Christ that also our lives may show forth the glory of God our God is a beautiful God our God is a wise God he's a God of abundance and he wants all of that for his children now there are sometimes those of you who are young parents maybe just starting but the older you get you you begin to look and see whether something is happening in your children when they are in grade one or when they are young you want them at the age of five or six to be in grade one if they are in grade one at 12 years old you'll be worried when they are 18 you want to find them moving to higher institution or some other career at different stages of their lives you are expecting some movement that's exactly what God is expecting from us you may have been a Christian for a long time and currently you are saying to yourself you know I've not reached this point or that point God is saying thank you welcome my child this is what I've been waiting for I've been waiting for you to recognize your current status 
and have a divine dissatisfaction and a longing to move from where you are. This morning, I'm saying that it's only if you have a relationship with God that you can actually do that. You don't have any communication with God if you don't have a relationship with Him. And so as we come to a close, I want to make a call for those who have not yet received Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Even as we try to meditate on this word that God has given to us this morning. And in this auditorium, if you have come to church today and you cannot raise up your hand when they say, who are those who are saved? You can't raise up your hand. Who are those who have uh, uh, who can call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, you can't raise up your hand, then I appeal to you that you should not leave this place the same way. You have heard the word of the Lord. It says, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. So now that you have heard the voice and the word of the Lord, if there are those who say, today I want to get into an intimate relationship with God. I want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior so that I can even begin to talk about my purpose that is found in Him and in the body of Christ. If that is you, can I see you raise up your hands? Whether you are down or you are at the top in the balcony, can you raise up your hand if you have not yet given your life to Christ as Lord and Savior. Do not leave this place the way you came. Today is the day of salvation. It's an opportunity for you to have God on your side, even in your life's battles. Can I see you raise your hand up? Wherever you are. I'm going to make that call once more. And wait. For those who are saying, Lord, here I am today. I want to give my life to you as Lord and Savior. And those who are online, we might not see you. We might not be able to see you. And you might be watching and saying, I'm giving my life to Christ. What do I do? There's a number that will appear on the screen. And you can call that number. And when you call that number, they will take you through. And in the interest of the fact that we are not sure of those who might be doing that online, we are just all going to repeat the sinner's prayer this morning. Even for those who may not be wanting to raise up their hands. But we are saying, God needs you to make a stand for him. So we're saying this prayer in the interest of those, especially online. And let's say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I accept that I am a sinner. Forgive me my sins. Cleanse me. Sanctify me. Make me pure and whole again. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus died and rose again for my sins. I accept you as Lord and personal Savior. Amen. God bless you.
on it may get hard at times it might get even more difficult more dangerous but Lord we want to press on press on we pray in the mighty name of Jesus Holy Spirit empower each and every one of us to keep walking in your purposes there is a reason why we're still here. We're still standing. Lord Jehovah, help us to see the purpose for which that you have kept us, Lord. If we have forgotten, if we have gone astray, if we've grown weary, Lord Jehovah, bring us back today. For we want to press on, press on. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the hearts that have been encouraged, strengthened, uplifted today. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Everyone said amen. Hallelujah. Let us put our hands together and appreciate the servant of the Lord, our mother, that she has brought this very timely word. Thank you so much. We speak a blessing over you in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes. Let us go out there and keep pushing, keep pressing on. Yes. Do not allow the devil to have a walkover in whatever situation that stands before you. Get back in. If you jumped out of the ring, get back in. In the name of Jesus. Keep fighting. Keep pressing on. Amen. Let us fight a good fight. I wish to bring the service to an end. Before I do so, I want to remind those that raise their hands to my right, to your left, that side, you are our very important people, our very special guests. An elder of the church just wants to spend a, to spend a few minutes with you just to take you through how, what happens here in the church and also inform you of what will be coming in in the coming days. Remember the first Wednesday in the coming month, March. The church wants to get in touch with you and they will notify you when we're going to be having that special dinner with the senior pastors and you. So when you receive that call from us, just remember it is to encourage you to come to that session. Go through there and if you have responded in your heart to that call for salvation, even if you didn't raise your hand, just see Pastor Magaya. Pastor Magaya is here. He's wearing a gray suit. Just spend a few minutes with him. He's just going to take you through that process and to help you walk this journey with us. For those that arrived late and didn't get an opportunity to give the offering, there are two ushers here in front. You are more than welcome as we dismiss the service. Come down, give your offering. The elders of the church will receive an account for those offerings of the Lord. Amen. Family, let us say the grace together and we'll dismiss the service with a blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon and the rest of the week. God be with you. Amen.